And so this is what we need to do if we're going to make the food system around us more sustainable. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, if you're interested in learning more about what we do, in addition to housing the Packingtown Museum, uh, take a look at insidetheplant.com. You can learn more about what we do uh, and, uh, and what about, about what Bubbly Dynamics does. That's the design and build team behind the plant. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dominic Pasiga, Professor Emeritus uh, from Columbia College in Chicago, who literally wrote the book on the stockyards and uh, uh, we're very excited that Dominic has been part of our volunteer uh, committee that has designed and curated the Packingtown Museum. And um, take it away, Dominic. Hi, thank you, John. I'm going to uh, share screen here. It's going to take a second for me to set things up. I guess everybody can see that now, huh? Uh, so. I'm going to be talking about the Chicago Union Stockyards, uh, years of spectacle and innovation. Um, so let's begin. This is a map of uh, the various stockyards that were in the city before uh, 1865. Uh, so you can see there were maybe a half dozen stockyards uh, throughout the west and south side of the city. The oldest one was the Bull's Head Stockyard at the top of the slide, which was at about Ogden and Ashland Avenue. That opened in 1848. Perhaps the most important one, however, was the Sherman Stockyard along the lakefront, about where uh, Michael Reese Hospital was once located. John Sherman became very important in the organization of the Union Stockyard. This is a map of what the original stockyards uh, looked like. Uh, it was smaller than it would eventually be. It would eventually expand to 450 acres uh, of, of cattle pens, hog pens, sheep pens, and horse pens. It was the largest horse market in the world at one point. Um, so this is the original map. And even before the stockyard opened, it was a spectacle. People, tourists were coming to see the construction. Uh, this was built on a swamp and the swamp had to be drained. Uh, Octavius Chanute, who later worked with the Wright brothers on flight, uh, actually designed the Union Stockyard in 1865. Here's an, a look. Uh, it opened up on Christmas day, 1865. What better way to celebrate Christ's birthday in, in the most capitalist city in the world than to open a Union Stockyard? Uh, so this is the original gate, uh, which was, was lasted till about 1877. The photo on the left um, is a, a, an artist's uh, conception of what it looked like on opening day. You can see there was nothing behind it. It was lay, sitting out on the prairie uh, and uh, um, uh, far, uh, supposedly so far away from the city that people wouldn't even move down there, but they did. Uh, and opening day, you also had, it was later called the Transit House, but originally called Ho House. Uh, this was supposedly the finest hotel in the West. Uh, according to uh, advertisements, you could sit on the uh, porch there and look all the way across the prairie to Springfield. Uh, nothing uh, uh, broke up the uh, prairie uh, from the South here. Okay. Okay, so then by 1875 or so, the stockyards had grown quite a bit, and you can see that packing houses began to um, began to relocate from Bridgeport just to the west in the area we call Packingtown. The museum, of course, is called the Packingtown Museum, and and deals with the industries that were located there originally. Bubbly Creek, just to the north of the stockyards, was an open sewer for Packingtown. Uh, this is the bridge across Morgan Street at the time. Uh, the water was supposedly so crusty from the uh, uh, offal that was dropped into the, into the river from the packing houses, the waste from the packing houses, that squirrels could run across it without, uh, without drowning. However, sometimes dogs would chase them and disappear into the murky waters below. Bubbly Creek still exists, not this section of Bubbly Creek. There's still a little bit of Bubbly Creek up in the Central Manufacturing District near 30, 35th and Iron. And on a good day, it still bubbles. The rail connection was most important for the stockyards. Nine railroads uh, were behind the formation of the Union Stockyard. Uh, originally, cattle were driven on the hoof to the Chicago, uh, various smaller Chicago stockyards. Uh, and uh, so on, you could be sitting on, in your house on Archer Avenue and suddenly 400 hogs could, could walk by or 200 cattle, cowboys on horseback. Uh, but eventually the railroads began to dominate the transportation of, li of livestock. So this car could carry about 25 cattle or 200 hogs or sheep. It was faster, it was more efficient. It allowed for a larger hinterland, that is a larger 
marketplace that Chicago could, uh, uh, could exploit. The other big railroad uh, change, in, you know, importantly, was the refrigerated cars. And the importance of refrigeration was very central for Chicago meat packers to come to dominate the industry. Now, originally, uh, U.S. railroads uh, refused to actually carry the uh, uh, chilled beef because they could make more money carrying live animals they charged by the pound. Um, so the Canadian Railroad, the uh, Grand Trunk, came down through Wisconsin and uh, into northern Illinois and over to the stockyards and began to transport chilled, transport chilled beef into Canada and then around down to New England, New York, and Philadelphia. After that happened, the U.S. railroads began to uh, compete for the, uh, for, the, for the refrigerated cars. It gave Chicago a national market and created the possibility of, of dominating that market, which it quickly did. If you were a visitor to the stockyards, you would probably come through the Stone Gate, which is off on Exchange, uh, just uh, Exchange in Peoria, just east, uh, I'm sorry, just west of Halsted Street. The gate still stands, the little uh, uh, building next to it, uh, which was the uh, Watchman's uh, building, uh, has been pulled down. Uh, it stands today as a memorial to the stockyards. And there's a s small exhibit uh, located with it behind it is, a, is the uh, monument to the firemen who died in a, in a fire here in Chicago. But if you were standing on the water tower, uh, as you were a visitor, this is looking southeast from the water tower. Uh, the building with the dome on it would later be called the amphitheater, but at this point was called the Dexter Park Pavilion. Uh, it was the home of the International Livestock Show, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But you can see the cattle pens from here. When you look to the southwest, uh, you'd see the sh huge sheep house, which had the possibility of, of holding something like uh, 100,000 sheep. These wooden ramps at the lower end of the slide were, uh, were ramps that uh, transported animals up uh, from the pens over into the various meatpacking houses. And of course, what's really striking about this film is the pollution in the, in the background and the stench. Most people remember the stench of the stockyards. If you're a little bit older, uh, you remember the smell. And if you're not that old, you remember other smells from the packing town district uh, sometimes still uh, remind you of its original uh, business. But nevertheless, uh, uh, the, the stockyard began to really dominate the meatpacking and livestock industry in the country as a whole. It, when I talk about spectacle, one has to understand it was a spectacle from the very beginning. Uh, here we have, uh, this is one of the tourist books that were handed out free at Swift and Company. Uh, they were guidebooks. Uh, people, over 500,000 tourists came in 1900 alone. Uh, just to walk packing houses. People like Sarah Bernhardt, uh, the uh, Russian princes, uh, Japanese princes traveled from all over the world to come and see this because this was the modern. This was the explosion of the modern in your face. Everybody knew how to kill a hog. Basically, we had some connection, rural connection. Uh, grandpa would you know, grab the hog by the hind leg, hoist him up on a tree, cut his throat and work on him. Uh, it took about eight to 10 hours uh, for a skilled butcher and his uh, assistant to uh, dress a beef, that is to take a steer apart. At Chicago, it took about uh, 36 minutes. So this was the modern, this was the excitement. People were coming to see this. It was almost unbelievable. I mean, what's more important to people than eating meat, right? Food, uh, it's central to our existence. And here was this mass industrialization. This was the modern creating what the, uh, what, what, what's sometimes called a satori, which means a slap in the face or an epiphany uh, for people. Here are the cattle pens circa 1924. The tall building in the background is the, it was pulled down in 1971. But here we have the one day records, almost 50,000 head of cattle, 49,128 head of cattle, calves over 10,000. What really strikes me is I worked in the stockyards for a while and I worked in the hog hunt. I have 122,749 hogs show up in one day for the market. It's just an overwhelming number. I mean, uh, the most we saw when I was working there were maybe three or 5,000. Uh, look at 71,000 sheep. 
but that record yearly run in 1924 is really outstanding. 18,643,539 head of livestock unloaded at Chicago. That's why the Tribune called it organized chaos. You could walk through the sea of pens and get lost very easily unless you knew the method. And Chanute was very good at this. He ended up putting a, 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 an address on just about every pen. So once you knew the system, D block pen 43A, you knew where to go and you could move around. Uh, but if you were an outsider, uh, it seemed like you know, a real sense of chaos. When you took these tours in the Chicago stockyards, you'd be taken up to the very top. Uh, after you went through the cattle pens and saw the hog house and the sheep house, you'd be taken into the uh, meatpacking houses. And the first thing you would take is an elevator to the roof of the very various meatpacking plants. This is a swift plant. And here you would see the hogs being, that were driven up the ramps to the very ceilings. Here they would be rested and watered down, and then they would go under uh, merry way. First to the hog kill. So the hog kill, these gentlemen are, are known as shacklers. They would shackle the hind leg of the, hog leg of the hog. The hog would be pulled up into the air on what was called a Hereford wheel. And uh, the mechanization process began. It would go from the Hereford wheel to the sticker, which you can see here on the, on the lower right, slaughtering a hog. And from that point on, it would pass literally an army of men and women uh, as it made its way to the coolers. About 25% of the workforce by 1920 was female in the Chicago stockyards. So the upper right-hand corner is a picture of a, the hog boiling machine. When the hogs would die, they would be shipped in there to loosen the hairs. They would be in a vat of boiling water. Then they would go through the hog scraper, uh, which is a larger picture on the bottom. And finally, off to the hog freezer room. And there you can see guards, uh, I'm sorry, and inspectors inspecting the meat at Swift and Company. So about 1900, about 32,000 workers uh, worked in Packing Town. By World War I, uh, nearly 50,000 workers worked in the plants as they reached capacity. They were white collar and blue collar jobs. By 1920, as I said before, about 20%, a little bit more perhaps, of the workforce was female. You know, my students always said, well, women didn't go to work until, you know, World War II. But women of color and immigrant women have always gone to work in, in industry in, in, in the United States. Uh, and this was very, very uh, obvious in, in the Chicago stockyards. In, once they went past through the hog uh, kills, they passed, walked into the cattle rooms. And here you would see a stunner. Now, these uh, pens were very tight. The cattle were driven in, in pairs. And behind them, a wall would come down and, and so forth and so on. Uh, so here the stunner uh, would uh, take the animal, knock him out with the uh, sledgehammer. Now, the cattle in general don't, uh, uh, when they're when these kinds of tight conditions, they butt with their heads down and it would have been impossible to hit them. So what he would do is he would take the, um, uh, the sledgehammer and rub their nose and then they'd look up and then he would come down with the sledgehammer. And once they were knocked out, they went down uh, on the kill line. Here you see this assembly line where the livestock now knocked out and slaughtered uh, past some 200 workers. And it was some 35 minutes from st uh, Stunner uh, to the cooler. This is heading, uh, cutting the heads off and skinning the animals in Chicago about 1904. Looking for a job, about circa 1904, about 2,000 to 7,000 workers gathered daily at the packing houses. Generally, it was day labor. Straw bosses would open those doors here at Armor Company, come out and say, well, I need somebody to lug beef, or I need somebody to pull gut strings, or I need somebody who, you know, speak. Um, and men would raise their hand, and they would get a brass tag. They'd come in, they'd turn the brass tag in after the day's work and get paid and be back outside again. Unless the straw boss liked you and kept you on. And one of the ways that straw bosses liked you was if you had a cousin or somebody in the plant who knew him, who slipped him a couple of dollars. Because there's no social security, there's no filling out forms, there's no unemployment compensation. You just work. If you can walk, you can work. Uh, and this was a lot of skilled and unskilled animals uh, and workers. Women took up the knife uh, after 1894. Uh, before that, women were not allowed to use the knife and they broke a strike in the sausage department. 
And here you can see them working in the sausage part and cutting meat up into smaller pieces to be in, uh, uh, dropped into the grinders. Swift and Company General Offices. The Swift and Company General Office was, was the second one and it lasted until Swift left in 1961. Um, this uh, Swift and Company General Office was the first uh, building, the first office building in the city of Chicago to be air conditioned. And here you can see the sales department uh, at Swift and Company, wide open spaces, uh, you know, uh, so that uh, workers would, would be watched constantly by uh, their uh, foreman. Uh, mo many of these, of course, were men. Uh, later, many more women came to work in the Swift and Company offices. By, uh, by 1910 or so, there were several thousand workers in that building. The meat packers were experts at advertising. Uh, this is a, uh, a little card that was mailed across the country, a little postcard. Uh, kind of strikes me as funny that even the children make a toy of an empty can. I don't know how many of you have had children, but I doubt that many of you have let them work with a, 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 an open tin can, uh, et cetera, but, uh, so they can slice their hands open. Uh, but these uh, cards were very, very effective. Uh, and, you know, they had various, um, uh, they would put out calendars and all kinds of advertising. In fact, uh, even today, if you go on eBay, and you punch in Chicago stockyards, you can find all kinds of uh, things from ashtrays to glasses, to maps, to photographs, to uh, a tremendous amount of uh, postcards, all uh, advertising or uh, sending images of the, of, the, of the Union stockyards out. One of the spectacles that sh sh Chicago stockyards uh, unfortunately had um, ever, ever since almost from the beginning, the first fire I think was 1867. But in 1910, the Morris fire at Nelson Morris Meatpacking cost the lives of 23 people. 21 of them were firemen. This was the largest loss of uh, first responders uh, in a fire uh, until 9-11. And this happened here in, uh, in the Chicago stockyards, just west, just west of uh, the, the livestock pens. Uh, this was happened, uh, I believe, on December 23rd. Uh, and uh, the chief of, of the fire department also uh, died. And that there's a memorial to that uh, fire and to all firemen who died in service uh, uh, right behind the stone gate today. But in 1934, a much larger fire took place. And this only ended up in the death of one person. But this is when the cattle pens caught on fire on May, uh, in May of 1934. Uh, there were ramps that went over to stockyards that people could drive over. They were uh, uh, raised by docks that you could drive over to stockyards. And apparently someone driving threw out a lit cigar and the lit cigar, it was a very hot day. It was, it was uh, during the, the, the dust bowl and it was very, it was 90 degrees. It had been 90 degrees for a week already. Uh, it was very dry. There hadn't been rain since I think March, early April. Um, and when the cigar hit the, the hay, uh, it exploded in, into a fire uh, that swept through the Union stockyards. Uh, the fire was quite outstanding. Um, uh, you can see other uh, pictures of it here. Uh, here you see at the top, uh, one of the stockyard buildings being burned down. Here you see, once again, spectacle, people coming from all over the city to come and watch the fire. Uh, this top on your top right uh, is a picture of uh, the Drover's Bank, which was across uh, Halsted Street. So the fire actually leapt across Halsted Street and burned into Canaryville. The lower uh, right-hand side picture is a picture of the Stockyard Inn and, and uh, other uh, buildings that were located there. So this was a devastating fire, that, uh, but the Stockyard uh, never closed for a day. Uh, they put up temporary pens right away. They put up temporary sheds for the commission men and the market uh, maintained itself. In the 1930s, United Packing House workers arrived in uh, Chicago stockyards, and uh, there had been various attempts to uh, organize the men and, the meat and women in the meat packing and, and, uh, and in the livestock market, the meat packing houses and the livestock market. But the CIO was finally the most successful to, uh, to come into the area. And it had an organizational drive, which began in 1937. There were huge strikes in 1946 and 1948. If you look at the slide, it says Negro and white unite and fight. This is really important because uh, African Americans became a very important part of the workforce after about 1904, from and especially after 1917. Um, 
And there, of course, racial divisions, there were ethnic divisions previous to this in the meatpacking houses. For instance, packers would, if, if, if Poles began to dominate one department, they would bring in Lithuanians into that department. And Lithuanians and Poles didn't often get along together. Or they'd bring Germans into the department, they wouldn't speak to the Poles and so forth. And so there'd be this kind of ethnic division which would you know, work against unionization. Well, the ultimate divider, of course, was race in the United States and uh, African-Americans coming in in large numbers to the meatpacking houses. Uh, caused racial strife. Uh, the CIO tried to overcome that and did it uh, very successfully. The United uh, Packing House Workers uh, Organizing Committee later became, uh, I'm sorry, the Packing House Workers Organizing Committee later became the United Packing House Workers of America, uh, which was very, and they played a very important role in the Black Civil Rights Movement. Um, today they're known as the United Food and Commercial Workers of America. These are some of the first women to join the union and they, they are women who worked in the canning department uh, about 1940 at Armour and Company. World War II, the stockyards began to revive during World War II. They, um, well, let me put it this way, from 1893 to 1933, there were never fewer than 13 million head of livestock at Chicago. Uh, being unloaded at Chicago. And of course, twice they peaked at over 18 million. After 1933, they would never reach 13 million head of livestock a year again. Uh, during the war, they peaked at, again at about 10 million, but then after the war, they began to slip again. Uh, stockyards were starting to de decentralize uh, and actually meatpacking houses were moving off the country sites, things like that. Trucks played a big role in this. Remember, the, st the stockyards were a child of the railroads. When trucks began to take over, uh, it, it creates a decentralization. Also, direct buying that is, the meat packers would buy directly from farmers rather than. I don't know how that happened. Can you hear me now? Okay. okay. So, all right, so uh, trucks, uh, sh uh, direct buying, interstate highway system, pollution laws, uh, all of, and, and nuisance laws uh, became very important in Chicago as the city began to crack down on the smells. One of the great spectacles of the stockyards was the International Livestock, Livestock Exposition, which ran from 1900 to 1975. Uh, it only uh, stopped running during World War II for, for two years. Other than that, it was a major exposition. And many of us who were older perhaps had attended the uh, uh, livestock show. Uh, it was put on in the International Amphitheater, which, would, which was actually created for the livestock show, though it became later a, a much larger venue. Here are some of the grand champions. Uh, by, purchased by uh, uh, the Great Western Beef Company, which uh, is still in existence and still is in the stockyards at about 40 in Halsted. Uh, it's not a slaughterhouse, but it is a, uh, uh, a meat uh, packing house. The industrialization. Wilson and Company closed in 1955. Armour and Swift announced their closing in 1959. At first, small packers remained in the market. Uh, and in the 1960s, uh, the early 1960s, the Union Stockyard uh, began to remodel. Uh, this is how Packingtown looked. Uh, this is about how Packingtown looked about 1984-85 uh, from the old uh, Damon Street uh, uh, overpass. You can see the buildings uh, are empty. You, uh, you can see through the windows all the way across. Remember these packing houses, the, the livestock were actually taken to the very roofs and then they were slaughtered and uh, came down by uh, at gravity when they were at full, full speed. The north end of the stockyard was the first to come down. It came down by about 1965, 66. And uh, here you see the Burnham and Root uh, water tower. Uh, Burnham and Root designed a stone gate. They also designed this water tower and many other buildings in the Chicago stockyards. So this water tower is the last thing to go on the north, north end and then was finally pulled down. That was all redeveloped for the central manufacturing district, which uh, by 1968 had fully occupied the space with, with small plants and those plants are still there. In 1971, the Union Stockyard closed and the Joliet Stockyard uh, opened and it lasted till about 1984. 
uh, basically central markets have become a thing of the past and uh, direct buying is the way that, uh, and, and, and industrial farming is the way that uh, the meat industry largely works today. So that Smithfield, uh, one of the largest pork packers in the world, uh, actually owns its own farms and, and slaughters its own animals. So there's been a tremendous amount of change, which uh, um, frankly has been a loss for family farms and small uh, producers. When the livestock market closed in 1971, they brought in a national wrecking company and uh, they cleared some 50 acres of cattle pens and eight buildings, including the eight story uh, uh, exchange building were knocked down rather quickly. And then that too was being redeveloped as part of the central manufacturing district and is today part of the uh, stockyard industrial park. This is what the stockyards look like today. Uh, you can see from, an air, from the air. Here we see the stockyard industrial district. Uh, and uh, this is where the cattle pens were uh, located, looking west towards Ashland Avenue from, a, from a uh, about Racine. I'm sorry, about uh, Morgan. Uh, much of this was financed by the tax increment financing district. There's a lot of uh, controversy about TIFs in Chicago. Some of them aren't used in the most uh, best way. But here, they actually did quite a bit of work and they um, have attracted, there are today about 15,000 people working in the stockyard district and, and the other parts of the area that were handed over to meat packing. Uh, this entire district that's uh, shaded in, in, uh, in the dark gray uh, is the former Union Stockyard Packing Town and adjacent districts where other meat packing plants were located. There were at one time 200 meat packing plants uh, close to this Union Stockyards. Many of these, uh, this area has been turned over to container traffic today. Uh, Chicago is, I think, the, the largest or second largest uh, container port in the country. Everybody thinks Los Angeles or New Jersey, but they send all their stuff to here to Chicago and then we put it on trucks and railroads and send it around the country. And of course there are plans and proposals. Uh, there have been, uh, I just talked to an architect the other day. Uh, they've just done some work on the old Livestock National Bank building uh, they're trying to uh, resurrect it. It's owned by the city. I understand you can buy it for a dollar, um, but then you have to put $7 million of uh, restoration work into it. So it's considered a city landmark. It's, by the way, uh, was built uh, about 1924 by uh, the Epstein Company, Epstein Engineering Company. Uh, and it resembles, of course, uh, uh, Independence Hall in Philadelphia because uh, the motto was that if you shipped your livestock to Chicago, you, you kept your independence. Uh, and uh, that was the, the original motto for the bank. Today, uh, the area is uh, as many growing green businesses like the Testa, in many ways that uh, the, the windmill there has become a new symbol of the area. This is the interior of Testa plant. It's a, a LEEDS certified a produce plant. I think it was the first one in the country that was LEEDS certified. Uh, it is on the site of the old Hammond Meat Packing Company, just uh, about a block or two uh, uh, east of the plant. And of course, the plant, uh, a food industry in the incubator and, and home of the Packing Town Museum. Uh, this was the old Pure Food Company, um, which John mentioned to you uh, later, uh, earlier about. And the last packing town, the last packing house in Chicago, or the last slaughterhouse rather in Chicago, there are about 100 packing houses in the Chicago land area. But park packing is the last slaughterhouse in Chicago. If park, when park closes, if park closes, uh, it will be the end of a, of a tradition in Chicago of slaughtering animals since the 1820s. Uh, so that is the last one. It's in the stockyard. It's at uh, 40th and Ashland, uh, and it has its own uh, wholesale market like the old packing houses did. Here we have a picture of the hogs that are unloaded. They kill about 200 hogs a day, in, uh, and sometimes they kill uh, 40 or 50 goats. Um, and um, um, they don't do tours like the stockyards, like the old packing houses used to. Okay, I think we can open up for questions and answers now, if you like. Ivan. Yeah, so as uh, we're getting those questions from the chat, making sure we got them all, um, I'm going to pop open another quick little poll um, just to uh, get, uh, get some feedback. Um, in terms of um, we 
saw in the chat that there's a lot of people, right, that um, knew someone or, 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 or lived in the area before. Uh, so kind of just checking the temperature of the room to see how many more uh, of you all um, might have lived and or worked or known someone that lived or worked in the area. Um, because uh, we definitely will be, uh, uh, that's definitely something we want to highlight is kind of the, the families and the, and the people, specifically the different Im immigrant groups that were coming to the stockyards throughout its, um, you know, 150 plus years of existence, um, even in even to today. Um, so uh, we'll definitely be um, providing some info, a little more info on that in the chat um, in, as we get some responses here. Okay. Uh, one thing I would like to say, um, uh, if you have, if you know anyone who, or your family lived in the stock, lived in the, in the area, worked in the stockyards, if you have photographs to plant, would be very interested in, uh, in uh, seeing them. We could make copies and you'd get the original back, uh, but we might be able to use some of them. We're especially interested in various immigrant groups, Germans, Irish, uh, et cetera, uh, who settled in the area, African-American pictures. Uh, so any, anybody who worked in the stockyards or lived close to the stockyards, if you have family photographs, uh, and especially if you have photographs of people working or, uh, you know, not staged photographs, though we, we'll accept those as well, uh, we'd be very happy to, uh, uh, to uh, accept them and we would scan them at high resolution and return them to you, of course. All right, thank you for those responses. Um, so now um, we can turn it over to some of the questions that we collected from the chat. So um, Carolee and Seo, if you wanna share some of those questions that we got um, and then Dominic can go ahead and answer those. Awesome, thank you so much, that was awesome. Um, so the first question I have is from Jeffrey. Why union in the name Union Stockyards? Okay, very simply, the union in 1865 meant two things, right? One was the union. Uh, the union had been uh, preserved by the Civil War. Uh, the Confederacy had been defeated in the stock and, and, the United, and the country had remained united. More importantly for the Union Stockyards, it was a, un a union of all the little stockyards in Chicago when they were brought together. So there had been a half dozen or so smaller stockyards, the Sherman Stockyards, the Bull's Head, the Brighton Stockyards, which were located uh, right around where Lindy's Chili is now located at, the, at Western and, uh, and Archer um, and, and McKinley Park. Um, and they were brought together into one united stockyard. So uh, taking on the word union. And also remember that most of the people who worked, uh, who organized the Union Stockyards had been friends and supporters of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, who had just been martyred uh, earlier that year. And so the idea of union was symbolic in two different kinds of ways. And then we've got another question from Lynn. What was the pay for men and women and white versus blue collar workers? Ah, well, you know, of course, over 150 year history, it changes over time. Uh, but in about 1904, uh, the average uh, pay for an unskilled worker in the packing houses was about 14 and a half cents an hour. Uh, so men made somewhere, and they usually work 10 to 12 hour days. So they were made somewhere around a dollar and a half a day. Uh, skilled workers made more. You can actually, uh, skilled workers, especially those uh, at the beginning of the slaughtering process, those who uh, 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 slaughtered hogs uh, and cattle, as well as uh, the, the headsmen, the people who took off the heads, they made quite a bit more. They could make up to 50 cents an hour. Uh, so they were seen as the sort of skilled elites, uh, especially those who uh, worked with uh, um, skinning the animals, et cetera. Um, office workers, um, I'm not sure exactly what they were paid, but they were paid a little bit better than that too, depending once again on their, on their status in the, in the sort of administration. Uh, by the 1930s, uh, women were making about 33 cents an hour. They were making about 60, 50 to 60 cent, uh, percent of what a man was making. Um, the, the union struggled to try to get equal pay uh, during most of its history um, for women. Uh, so you had these various groups coming in and being brought in at different kinds of pay scales. Uh, one of the other things that women did, uh, especially, was they worked piecework. That is, they worked by the piece. So if they worked in the sausage department, by every sausage that they tied, they would get a penny or a half a penny, something like that. And often what happened 
was that when when uh, they started making enough money, the, the Packers would cut the prices again, and they would cut the, what they would pay per sausage again. So sometimes you were making much as a quarter of a penny per sausage. Uh, so it was uh, not a very well-paying job until uh, later on when unionization took place. Uh, okay. Awesome. And then another question for Mr. Pasiga. In your opinion, what played a bigger role in the demise of the stockyards? Would it be the advent of mechanically refrigerated rail and truck transport or the increase in product demand by Southwest and Pacific Rim states? Well, I think basically uh, what, what uh, led to the decline was the, the truck. Uh, the truck changed everything. Uh, by the time I worked there, I worked there from 1969 to 1971. Uh, I worked my way through college there. And um, we got about 90% of, of all cattle by truck and 100% of hogs and sheep by truck. Uh, rails uh, had really very, very much declined. And I don't think anybody, any, any railroad carries much livestock today. It's all done by truck. And that truck meant that, that it could, it, you could have a de decentralized market. So for instance, and, and this also added to direct buying. So for instance, let's say I'm a meat packer, Pasiga meat, and I wanna buy 50 hogs or uh, 5,000 hogs, whichever. I'll go straight to a farmer and say, why would you send it to Chicago where you have to pay 10%? I'm just gonna pick it up. You know, send it, give it to me directly. And I'll pay you what you would get at Chicago. Of course, then once the market dissolved, the, the market dissolved and you just got what I offered you. Uh, so uh, direct buying and, um, and also uh, the truck really led to its sort of uh, decline. Uh, so there were changes in the way animals were marketed uh, that were drastic. The creation of large industrial farms. I mean, if any of you travel through Southern Illinois, uh, you can get a whiff of some of these things. Some of the biggest hog farms in the world are in Southern Illinois. Uh, then you'll have 10, 15, 20,000 hogs uh, constantly under, under a roof, um, which is, is, is causing a tremendous amount of problems for the environment, pollution and so forth. Uh, Smithfield alone kills 125,000 hogs a day out in the Carolinas. Uh, so it, the, the whole process has really changed and the stockyards were seen as sort of old fashioned, uh, not very productive. Uh, I have to say that I think uh, had the stockyard survived, uh, the locavore movement might have uh, might have uh, revitalized it, but uh, it did not survive. And there are no major terminal markets uh, left in the country. There are only small uh, auction markets. And then we brought um, one that has come up a little bit, but where did the waste go? <laughs> well, uh, you know, um, the waste originally was dumped largely in the river, uh, the Bubbly Creek, which flowed into the south branch of the Chicago River and then flowed into Lake Michigan until the water, until the river was reversed in uh, 1900, um, successfully finally reversed in 1900. Um, but um, uh, also the meat packers began to use a lot of the waste to produce different kinds of products. Uh, uh, and John, John Adel may remember, we took a tour of uh, the old high grade plant on 39th Street on Pershing Road a few years ago uh, with uh, Franco Cipetti. And uh, in the basement, there was a hide room and there were stacks and stacks and stacks of cattle faces, the, fate, the skin from the faces of cattle. I said, my God, what do you use a cattle face for? And they said, well, you know, the chewies that you uh, give your dog, little chew bones, that's all made out of cattle faces. It's amazing uh, what it made out of animals. Uh, you know, um, gut strings were used for tennis rackets and violins. Uh, and when the stockyards were going, the little hairs, the little tiny hairs in the, in the ears of hogs were snipped out by, uh, by men and they were used to make paintbrushes uh, for artists. Uh, so they ended up using uh, what, what Swift said, we, we, we use everything but the squeal. And if we could can the squeal, we'd, we would sell that too. Uh, but they were never quite ready to do that. So it was really, in, in some ways, um, you know, a very efficient way of getting away waste. Uh, you know, in stockyards, they made chicken soup that had no chicken in it. <laughs> don't ask, don't ask me what was in it, because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 
I've got uh, another question from Margaret. Is there an archive or directory available listing all businesses within the yards, not just meat packers, but commission men, et cetera? Uh, well, there are various listings of those kinds of things, the commission men, the salesmen, the, the brokers, the um, speculators. Uh, they would have been listed under the Chicago Livestock Exchange. Some of those records are at the University of Illinois at Chicago. When, when the stockyards closed, they threw out a bunch of things and um, don't tell anybody, but I pulled a car up and I threw it all in a car and I drove it over to UIC and it, they're in the archives. They're called the stockyard collection. Um, and uh, so we preserved a lot of those records. Um, so a, a lot of that stuff is at UIC. Uh, also, some of it is at the Chicago Historical Museum. And Dominic, when you worked in the stockyards, um, what did you do and when uh, or which packing house did you work in? I, I didn't work for a packing house. I worked for the Union Stockyard and Transit Company. We owned the livestock market. Uh, so I never saw a kill at that point. Um, I uh, simply unloaded trucks and railroad cars and uh, put them in pens and then uh, uh, reloaded them on trucks and or gave them to truckers to reload. Uh, and then later on, I was a security guard uh, and I, uh, I was assistant head of security and I walked around the stockyards with my, uh, my cowboy boots and my, and my gun. Uh, and uh, that's how I worked my way through college. Uh, but I worked for the Union Stockyard and Transit Company, which owned the stockyard as opposed to packing town. My mother worked at Armour and Company and my, my grandfathers all worked in, in meat packing. Uh, I grew up in the back of the yards. Uh, and so, uh, you know, they would do these tours of the stockyards and we never did them because we sort of knew what was going on. But when I was writing the book, Franco Cipetti, who I mentioned before, uh, invited me to see a slaughter at his slaughterhouse. And uh, I, I did, I saw a slaughter of lambs uh, there, but that was the first and, and only time. And then Dominic, would you please clarify what the original packing house at the building that is now the plant where the Packing Town Museum is um, set to hopefully open this year? We're crossing our fingers. Um, but yeah, could you clarify what the original packing house was in the building? Well, it was Pure Foods. Um, John can probably tell you a little more about it than I can, uh, but it was a, uh, a, not a slaughterhouse, but it was a, uh, a, a meat packing house. So actually there's a difference between a packing house and a slaughterhouse. Okay? And most people get that confused because most of the big plants were both. Uh, but uh, this was a plant that uh, uh, processed meat uh, that it purchased, I, I take it from local meat packers, local slaughterhouses. Uh, and uh, so you did a lot of, uh, I, I do remember one thing when, when I was growing up, uh, all the bars and back of the yards had um, you know, uh, 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 hard-boiled eggs on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the bar, but they also had a tray of uh, pig's knuckles and the pig's knuckles uh, were free and you could chew on the pig's knuckles if you liked, I never did, uh, but they were all from Pure Food. Pure Food was famous for its uh, pig's knuckles. John, maybe you know, can say a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Pure Foods was, uh, was the name that was adopted in 1940. Uh, the company was originally, uh, or actually still is, Bueller Brothers, uh, and um, uh, Bueller built the plant in 1925, uh, and then in subsequent years, portions were added. Um, a major addition was in 1936, that's where Weiner Beer Company is right now, uh, and they were adding to the building right on through, I think, through the 90s even, uh, and so uh, the Bueller family is still in the packing business, as a matter of fact. Um, in 2007, uh, Pure Foods merged with Mariah Foods in Columbus, Indiana, and that's when the production shut down at the plant. Uh, I purchased the building in 2010. Uh, it had been uh, vacant, but, um, but, but kept intact. Uh, and so uh, when I bought it, it was actually described by the broker as a strip and rip, meaning the value in the building was the stainless steel and the copper. Uh, and the idea was that they would sell it to somebody who would strip out the, the metals and rip it down. Uh, and so um, we were very happy to return it to productive food production, uh, especially kind of on the cutting edge, uh, which is what the stockyards was known for. Packing Town was the, and Chicago in general was the home of food innovation um, since 
since the early days. And so um, we're very pleased to continue that. And also what are um, sort of the borders of where the stockyards would have been? Like how large of um, an area did that cover? Well, the, the livestock market itself, uh, the livestock market itself uh, ran from Halstead uh, to Racine from Pershing or 39th Street south to 47th Street. Um, but then, of course, what happened afterwards was meatpacking houses located just west of the stockyards in what we call Packing Town. And that area went over actually to Ashland Avenue and then beyond, in, in the case of Wilson and Company, all the way to Damon Avenue. Uh, there were also small meat packers in Bridgeport and Canaryville and in back of the yards that were just outside of those boundaries. The stockyard, which is the livestock market, uh, the place I worked for, the Union Stockyard Company, uh, actually covered 475 acres. The whole meatpacking industry covered well over 600 acres uh, on the south side. It was estimated in 1900 or so uh, that about one out of every four Chicago families were somehow dependent on the meatpacking business for their income. So 25% of all Chicagoans. Now that didn't mean they had to work for the stockyards, but they might work for a trucking company or they might work, uh, have a, a store or a, you know, a tavern. And my God, if you were from the back of the yards, you knew what a tavern was. There was about, there were, in 1914, 19, uh, there were one tavern for every 41 registered voters in the, in, in, in the back of the yards. There were average at three taverns per block and there were 40 taverns, it was called Whiskey Row that ran from about 40th in Ashland down to about 45th in Ashland. There were some 40 to 50 taverns in a row there. There's only one left, it's called Stanley's. It's at uh, one, one of the original um, uh, 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 Whiskey Row restaurant, uh, uh, Whiskey Row Taverns is located at 43rd in Ashland. Uh, there was also Whiskey Point, which was just down the block from uh, the plant. Uh, that's where um, McDowell Street, which was then called Gross Avenue, crossed, uh, I guess, Loomis and, um, and uh, uh, 46th Street. So there were six corners, and so that area was known as Whiskey Point. Uh, yeah, uh, I remember when my wife, uh, when we got married, my wife moved to Chicago. She said, "Why are there all these? There are all these taverns." I said, "Well, why not?" <laughs> And then I'm going to combine two kind of questions. John may also have a little more insight into this, but um, are there lingering environmental impacts left over from the stockyards, such as, you know, Bubbly Creek being nicknamed Bubbly Creek? Um, and are there updates and redevelopment up efforts in the area? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, John, you want to take it or do you want me to take it? Sure, I mean, I can, I can talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, the Packers were notorious for dumping. And so, uh, you know, part of, part of why Packingtown and the yards moved south in the first place was to get the stink out of the city and to get away from the regulatory, um, you know, from the, from the regulators inside of the city. And so uh, when you move out of town, you had a little bit more free license to do whatever you wanted. So Bubbly Creek, uh, of course, uh, used to extend a little bit farther. There was the West Fork and the, and the East Fork that are now filled in, uh, but they were notorious for crusting over at one point or for quite a while, actually. And Bubbly Creek, the rest of it was also uh, known uh, for quite a while for catching fire on a regular basis. And uh, folks would go down to the 35th Street Bridge to watch the, the little blue flames dance across the water uh, from, from the oils and fats uh, bubbling up. Uh, the kind of industrial pollution that we worry about today is actually vastly worse. And so what we're dealing with in Packingtown and, and the yards area is a little bit more, call it natural. Um, you know, the, on the plus side, we are not plagued with heavy metals and hydrocarbons and this sort of thing. Um, so which meatpacking plants today are actually a lot more dangerous in many ways than they were back in the day of, of Packingtown. Uh, the line speeds have gone up. Uh, the chemicals used uh, have gotten much, much nastier. Uh, so repetitive stress injuries, it's still very much done by uh, new immigrants to the country uh, and who are treated every bit as poorly today as they were uh, back in Upton Sinclair's day. So uh, Dominic, I don't know if you want to add anything to yeah. that. Yeah, you know, I uh, back in the... Uh, uh, 
mid 70s and early 80s, uh, when I was in graduate school, I was, would do bus tours. Uh, and one of the bus tours was through the stockyards. This is another way that I paid my way to school. And uh, I remember driving through Packingtown at one point and, and there was flames jumping out of the ground uh, like, like little volcanoes. Uh, and uh, we stopped the bus. I went over to talk to the fireman and he explained that the hide cellars were so deep and when the buildings were knocked down, they just filled them up and there was all this grease, you know, many feet under the ground. And on a hot day, they would simply combust. They would just erupt. And so there would be these like little stockyard volcanoes going up in the air. Uh, and the fire department would call to put them out. And it was one of the reasons uh, that redevelopment of the banking down area took such a long time because it was this, this real environmental problem. Uh, another thing that I, 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 I remember very much is when Darling and Company was still working uh, there. Uh, it, it, this has been cleaned up, but there were huge swimming pools, not swimming pools really, but huge pools, containers that carried, um, you know, um, the deposits of animals, let's uh, say, okay? Uh, or in French, we call it murd. Right. And uh, I took a tour down there, down Packers Avenue, and uh, uh, they, they would shoot these things up in the air, uh, like a fountain, this brown fountain shooting up in the air. And, um, and uh, I had to explain to I once had a whole group of Frenchmen there, and I had to explain to them that it was basically a, uh, if you'll excuse the language, a shit fountain, uh, and it was used to aerate before they could use it as fertilizer. Now that's all been filled in. That's no longer there, but there are still some, you know, some problems with some of the plants that are there. And then we hit a little upon immigration and how there have been, um, you know, movements of different uh, cultures and ethnic groups coming through the packing town, or rather the Union Stockyards. Could we? Could you maybe speak a little bit about um, immigration and how there have been uh different kind of like waves of cultures sure uh let me say that uh there have been the stockyards kind of represent almost every wave of immigration that's come into the chicago area uh since its founding uh if you put the stockyards in the middle and you drew a circle around it about a diameter of about a mile and a half to two miles you would count 36 catholic parishes originally each one representing either a different ethnic group or uh, a different phase of an ethnic group's movement at the time. Many of those have closed now. There'd also be many different Lutheran and, and uh, other kinds of Protestant churches and synagogues uh, located in the area. So wave after wave of people came. In, in the beginning, uh, many of them were uh, uh, native born whites who came uh, to work in the meatpacking industry, but then they were followed largely by Irish and Germans. Germans were often skilled butchers and then Czechs. Uh, and then Poles and Lithuanians and Slovaks uh, in large numbers. Um, and uh, uh, I, in back of the yards alone, and we have a map on the, uh, on, on the wall in the museum, there were 14 Catholic churches within, uh, you know, um, um, a, a stone's throw from the whites, uh, from, the, from the stockyards, I almost said from the White Sox, uh, from the stockyards. Uh, I guess I have baseball on my mind, it starts tomorrow. Uh, and. Um, uh, so, you know, there's just a, this tremendous wave after wave. And then, of course, African-Americans come in in large numbers after 1904, but especially between 1915 and 1919, when the Great Migration begins, and then again in the 20s and, and 30s. Uh, so that by 1957, 1958, uh, 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 a census was taken, and it said that uh, there were about uh, 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 people of color, Hispanics and, 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 and Blacks, primarily Mexicans and Blacks, made up 80% of the, of the workforce in the, in the meatpacking houses. Not in the union stockyard, not in the, in the cattle market, but in the, in, in the packing houses. Um, and so you had this uh, wave after wave of change. So you have the great, you have large numbers of, of Mexicans coming in in the 1920s. Uh, they form a, a church called St. Mary's at 45th in uh, Ashland. Um, and eventually uh, today they dominate the area. Uh, Mexicans dominate and, and African-Americans dominate the area. So it's, it's just been wave after wave of change. It's actually, it's a way of, uh, you know, if you walk around the neighborhood and you look at the church cornerstones, You'll see, you know, some of them are in English, if it was a Protestant church, but some of them are in Latin, and the other side of the cornerstone uh, will be in the language of the original settlers. So you see Lithuanian and Polish and Slovak and German and Russian and so forth. It's, it's quite, quite interesting. As a, as a historian, as someone who 
teaches classes that deal largely with immigration or used to teach anyway, classes that deal largely with immigration. I, I was always uh, amazed at the kind of movement of people across the city. And can we talk about strikes? Like how yeah. did workers organize and all of that? Sure. Uh, the first strike in the stockyards was 1869. It was four years after the stockyards opened. It was mostly livestock handlers who struck. Uh, later on, uh, 80, uh, 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 in 1877, the Great Railroad Strike, packing house workers took part in that. They took part in the Great Eight Hour Strikes during the, the Haymarket Riot or the Haymarket Affair in 1886. Uh, when Pullman went on strike, we think of it as just railroads, but remember Pullman made railroad cars for all kinds of uh, reasons. And um, so stockyard workers refused to deal with railroad cars that were made by Pullman. Uh, and there were massive riots in the railroad rail yards. Uh, cars were burned. They fought with um, the uh, US Army. Uh, in 1904, there was a big strike uh, also led, led by the Amalgamated Meat Cutters and Butcher Workmen. And then again in 1921, a big strike. Um, and many of these were, you know, one can make the argument also that the 1919 race riot was largely over jobs in the stockyards uh, as well. Uh, and, and whether blacks would be unionized or not. Uh, the unions uh, did uh, 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 by 1919 open their doors to, to African-Americans and there were large African-American locals. Uh, so it's uh, the strike thing. But then when you hit the four, in 1946 and 1948, the big CIO strikes, and then there were a lot of wildcat strikes uh, on into the 1950s and 60s. Uh, many of the meatpacking companies were very anti-union, especially Wilson and company. Uh, Wilson basically said, that's it, we're moving. We're not, and, and they moved to a large, a large part of their operation to Oklahoma, which was an anti-union state and uh, ran a non-union plant for quite a long time. Cool. Um, these are a little more specific in questions. So uh, let's see, we've got, I know the Iroquois theater fire had a significant impact on fire code around the country. Did any of the two fires that were mentioned in the lecture have any similar impact with fire codes? You know, uh, not that I know. Um, because, um, um, you know, when, when the 1934 fire took place, there was all this, this movement uh, that to build, rebuild the stockyard as fireproof. So instead of wooden pens, they would have uh, uh, pens that were made out of steel, etc. Uh, that actually did not occur. Uh, the pens were wooden even when I was working there. Um, it was cheaper to build uh, out of wood. Uh, and, and so they did. Um, I think... Um, there may have been, I mean, obviously meatpacking plants today are much safer from fire than they used to be, though they still, as John pointed out, treat workers pretty poorly. Um, but uh, uh, the wooden floor, you know, in that, in that Morris fire in 1910, they were brick buildings, but the interiors were all made out of wood and the floors were wooden and they were covered with grease and oils and blood. Uh, highly combustible material. And when it, 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 it took off, it just burned the insides out. And then the walls collapsed outwards on top of the firemen and killed those 21 firemen. And it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a story. I mean, people know about the Iroquois fire. Uh, they know about the Great Chicago fire, but few people actually talk too much about the, uh, the, that Morris fire. There was a book put out a few years ago on uh, fires in the Chicago stockyards, which was very helpful to me. Um, and this is a little bit maybe for John as well, but um, some folks are asking, you know, pig knuckles, what, what is that like? And what is the plant kind of like now? Like, is there meat processing at the plant? Um, sure. Um, pig knuckles is a question that I'm not going to answer. I don't actually know the answer, to be honest. Um, not something I've ever had, but we do have a wonderful collection of photographs uh, taken in uh, 1979 and 80. Um, and Carolee, you can remind me of the um, photographer's name uh, of um, not only of uh, pig knuckles being produced, but also some of the advertising from Pure Foods and, and Bueller Brothers. Uh, so these days at the plant, we do not produce, uh, there's really no meat production happening. 
And uh, I mentioned that there's a lot of food kind of innovation going on. Most of the products at the plant these days are, uh, are actually vegan, uh, not specifically necessarily, but, uh, but in the aggregate, they primarily are. And um, of the 20 something businesses, there's brewing and uh, baking, there's kombucha, there's chocolate making, uh, gelato, um, cheese distribution. Uh, we have five indoor farms uh, and all of these operate as separate businesses. Uh, and so, you know, we work to try to help those businesses where we can um, with uh, infrastructure and, uh, you know, what, what advice we can give. Uh, but they do all operate as, as separate businesses. And there's quite a bit of interest um, from those businesses in developing new products. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to compete with the big companies. And so uh, by functioning together, as a community, they're able to uh, to do that a little bit better. Awesome. Um, and then we have one that is uh, very, uh, I guess, with the times. But do we know any insight into how the Spanish flu affected the workforce? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, yeah, when the Spanish flu was happening. Yeah, the Spanish flu hit, this, hit the back of the yards neighborhoods uh, very hard. Um, there had always been an uh, outbreak of these kinds of, oh, my, I'm a, you can hear me, right? Yeah, uh, uh, there's always been an outbreak of these kinds of diseases in the neighborhood, um, but the Spanish flu was particularly bad. Um, I remember, um, I don't have the numbers right with me, but in an earlier book that I wrote called Polish Immigrants and Industrial Chicago, I traced some of that. Churches were closed, schools were closed. Uh, the neighborhood uh, suffered from it quite a bit. Um, you know, it was also, the, besides the Spanish flu, there was an always an ongoing problem with tuberculosis too in the plants and also in the, uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, the, the rate of uh, death from uh, tuberculosis in the back of the yards was 67% higher than the rest of the city. Now, you understand back of the yards is like uh, a 20-minute streetcar ride from Hyde Park, uh, where it was very different. So you had social class differences here that were, were, were very large and, and remain very large on the south side, you know, as, as they have uh, throughout most of the city's history. Um, that is so wild. And um, my next question is regarding livestock. Um, so Peoria had stockyards as well. Mm -hmm. um, were those animals sent to Chicago or were they processed in Peoria and then sent to Chicago to be processed? Um, there was a Peoria stockyard and uh, the, the meatpacking plants were smaller there. Uh, Chicago's biggest rival, of course, was Omaha and Kansas City, uh, and also South St. Paul. Uh, they all had large stockyards. Now, what happened was, of course, that the stockyards, when Chicago began to centralize after about, after about 1878, 1880, um, uh, eventually what happened was most of the meatpackers began then to decentralize a little bit. So the Swift and Company, Armour and Company, and so forth, so on, would open plants at smaller stockyards around the Midwest. Um, so the, the animals that were sold and bought at uh, Peoria, most of them were either processed in the area or they were sent to other meatpacking plants throughout the country, as, as was happening in Chicago. You know, until, until refrigeration really set in in Chicago, for instance, most of the animals were actually shipped east. Uh, if those of you who've been in New York and maybe gone to the meatpacking district, which tonight is kind of, a, today is kind of a she-she, you know, nightlife district in the city, but it was actually filled with meatpacking houses and there was a, there was a stockyard there. And Chicago would actually uh, ray, uh, send, uh, they would purchase animals at the Chicago stockyards, put them back on trains and send them east. Uh, and when I was working in the, in the yards in the 60s and early 70s, um, we shipped a, a good deal of livestock east basically for the kosher kill, uh, cattle for the kosher kill, uh, because uh, according to kosher law, you have to eat the meat within a certain amount of hours after it's slaughtered. And there are large uh, kosher packing houses in New Jersey uh, and, and, and in New York, uh, outside the city, uh, so that uh, this uh, served the, the uh, Jewish communities in, on the East Coast. Um, and here too, we also had kosher kills, of course. Mm 
let's see we've got a, a few remaining questions um are, is there current uh processing right now in the stockyards and if so what kind of animals are uh being uh processed well park park packing is the last park packing uh, last slaughterhouse in chicago and it's located at about 40th and ashland and they slaughter hogs and goats and um, that's it uh, everything else has moved outside of the city as far as slaughtering goes. There are plenty of meatpacking plants which process meat, like the like Pure Foods used to do. Um, and in terms of processing with inspectors, um, how and what kind of a job was an inspector um, kind of privy to on a on a daily? Well, originally before Upton Sinclair's jungle and the uh, uh, Pure Meat Inspection Act was passed and, and during the Teddy Roosevelt's administration. Uh, only meat packers were inspected uh, uh, by federal inspectors, that, those that shipped overseas. So only the big ones like Armour and Swift and Morris, um, s and uh, But then uh, a more, more uh, intricate meat, meat inspection took place. Of course, you know, it's all, all part of the science too. I mean, science evolves over time. Um, you know, uh, bacteria, in, nobody's talking about bacteria in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. Uh, the feeling was about, uh, there was a lot of fear about hoof and mouth disease and, 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 and uh, hog, hog diseases that, that might be carried into the meat. So that actually in, at the turn of the century, it was believed uh, in, the, in the hog houses, in the hog slaughterhouses, that if, um, if uh, after the slaughter took place, they would keep the head with the rest of the hog body and there are eye photographs of them uh, uh, hanging on a wall with a hog head at the very top. Uh, it was believed that the inspectors, if they could pull the hog head down, they could look in the hog head and see if it was diseased. And that's how they'd know whether the animal was, whether, whether the rest of the meat was good. Often hog heads got misplaced. They went under wrong bodies, things like that. So it wasn't really great inspection. Also, a lot of meat packers inspected the meat themselves. And this is, by the way, is, is true today. I mean, you, one of the problems you have with meat packing is that the FDA, uh, has been gutted basically since the Reagan years. And um, uh, so a lot of these packing plants actually inspect the meat themselves, which is part of the problem. Uh, whenever you have somebody who's inspecting themselves, uh, they often look the other way. Uh, look, there, I, I, I uh, have seen uh, hogs that, uh, in the hog house that I, I, I don't know who would eat them. Uh, they looked like they were in terrible condition, uh, but somebody always bought them and slaughtered them, uh, you know. Um, there you go. <laughs> and then we also have um, Nelson Morris is buried at Rose Hill Cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, when uh, when Paula was researching his life, she learned that his son Nelson Morris Jr. survived the crash of the Hindenburg. Do we know if this is true? I I don't. That I don't know. Um, he had a son who had died earlier, who took over his business right after uh, uh, he passed away. And then when, when the, his son died, they sold the business to Armour and Company in 1923, I believe it was. Um, Nelson Morris was born in Germany. He uh, began his life as a uh, livestock buyer at the Sherman Stockyards. Actually, he worked in a very, as a young boy, he worked in kind of various kinds of jobs, driving animals. and. Uh, cleaning pens and things like that. And then later became a livestock buyer. And then in the 1870s, I believe it is, he uh, began to uh, slaughter animals um, and was one of the most important meat packers at the time. But the business, uh, you know, the business was also connected with uh, the Morris family and the Darling family and the Swift family intermarried quite a bit too. Um, and, uh, you know, Nelson's Morris, uh, Nelson Morris, that wasn't his original name, of course, uh, I'm sure, uh, question the, the person who asked the question knows that his uh he, he was known as nelson's morris so he worked for somebody his first name was morris and, and some guy named nelson employed him and so he was known as nelson's morris he spoke with a heavy thick german accent at the time uh, and so he just changed his name he anglicized it to nelson morris he's of a german jewish background i feel like that's a good podcast in the in the making like um and then our last few questions, 
Uh, what was the connection between the stockyards management and the back of the yards neighborhood council? Hostile, uh, <laughs> right off from the very bat, beginning. The back of the yards neighborhood council was originally uh, organized by Saul Alinsky and uh, was connected in the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s, heavily with the union, union with the United Packing House Workers, organizing committee and, and et cetera of the CIO. And so it, it, it was very hostile at, at one point or another. You know, remember, this is a neighborhood that suffered from pollution uh, and suffered from the smell. Uh, the stench was so bad at times, um, you know, people would get sick. Um, and I grew up in the neighborhood. Uh, the Back of the Arts Council was always complaining about, you know, Darling and Company would have these trucks go through. They were filled with bloody bones uh, overflowing and uh, they forced them to put tarps over them. Sometimes they would spill things uh, on the streets. Um, the same would happen with uh, uh, various meat packers, et cetera. So often the, the relationship between the backyards, neighborhood council and the stockyard and the packing houses in particular was, was hostile. Uh, later it became a little more friendly, but by that time the industry basically disappeared and uh, people who lived in the back of the yards didn't work in the industry much anymore. Uh, and uh, they work at what they called, you know, after 1945, when uh, GIs came back uh, uh, from, from the war, Many of them didn't want to go to work in the stockyards. They wanted to work in what was called clean industries. And that was literally a neighborhood term. I'm going to go to work in a clean industry. And that meant working at Western Electric or Johnson & Johnson or one of the plants out in the clearing district or off, even off into Cicero. Uh, so that the stockyard, uh, the back of the yards became almost a sort of commuter area rather than just people walking into the plants themselves. So in, in a way, it was seen as more of a nuisance after a while. Cool. Um, and then our last uh, question at the moment is, what became of the Kansas City stockyards? Just like the Chicago stockyards, they closed down shortly thereafter. Most of the packing houses had left. Um, the, all the big central markets were going down very quickly. Uh, and I'd say within 20 years after the stockyards closed, just about every central market was gone. Awesome. That's all the questions that I've uh, kind of squirreled away here. Um, let's see. We're kind of on our last couple of minutes before 2.30. Um, if anybody is interested, we will be sending out a recording of this lecture. And I will probably pass this to Ivan. Yeah, so as we wrap up, uh, I just wanted to give everyone an opportunity, one more opportunity to answer the poll on the future events for the museum. I know the first poll didn't give you the option to choose multiple things. Um, so I'm going to show that real quick um, and then have you all um, help us kind of um, see where everyone's at in, in, in terms of interest as we hopefully plan future uh, events, both virtual and once things start to go a little bit back to normal. Uh, um, in person. So I'll give everyone a, a second there to, to respond. And it looks like there's one more question that uh, popped up in the chat, if uh, we want to address that real quick. Um, um, so uh, Matt asks, are there other museums about the stockyards? Um, there's a um, um... Uh, at Chicago History Museum, they have a whole section of the Chicago exhibit that is devoted to the stockyards. Um, other than that, I think that that's about it. Um, there are various archives that hold materials, but an actual exhibit, uh, I would suggest either our museum or going to the Chicago History Museum on the north side. They have a, a, a very large part of their upstairs, their Chicago rooms dedicated to the meatpacking industry. They actually have a chair made out of uh, steer uh, horns. Uh, which is quite quite interesting, and and then you can also say hello to Ivan who works there too, and so he'll be roaming around. And then I think we have one final one, and we can say this is the last one. Um, this one's from Michael. Um, are pa are packing houses stockyards concentrated anywhere today? No, they're largely spread out throughout the country. Uh, though some of the biggest ones are in the south, uh, as well as in the west. Um, and, you know, I'm not talking here about the uh, poultry uh, slaughterhouses, but basically uh, hogs, cattle, sheep, etc. Uh, they are throughout the Midwest, but the, usually in farm areas. 
once again, the truck allows them to go anywhere so that you can put a meatpacking house in the middle of a, a farm field and then attract cattle and livestock from the uh, adjacent farms. Uh, so uh, uh, the concentration that there once was no longer exists. All right, well, thank you uh, all for joining us. Uh, thank you, Dominic, for answering all those questions. And thank you, guys. Um, and um, it, we're gonna maybe, uh, again, I think I wanna reiterate that um, if anyone has any family photos or any or knows anyone that might have any, all right, we would really like to see those. Um, and you can, um, we can drop that email in the chat so that you all could contact us. Or if you already have them digitized, you can send them right over. Um, if not, um, we can uh, work something out. Um, and yeah, so uh, stay tuned for more events from the Packing Town as we, uh, you know, uh, as we go forward. Um, and we're really excited for everyone joining us um, and glad we got uh, to do this, uh, you know, uh, virtually, uh, hopefully in person soon. Um, so thank you all and we will see you soon, hopefully. Thank you guys. Uh, thanks for, for dropping by. I hope we can meet in person soon. I know you're all getting real tired of this and so are we. Take care. Bye.